It's great to be joined today by Robert Zubrin, who's an aerospace engineer, author, and also one of the driving forces behind the Mars Direct project, which is a proposal to uh, reduce both the cost and complexity of a mission to Mars. So, Robert, let's just start at, at sort of the top. Uh, other proposals to go to Mars, in what ways are they more complex than maybe they need to be? Well, um, the classic uh, example of an overcomplex program was the NASA 90 day report, which uh, said before we could go to Mars, we had to build a space station, we had to build hangars on the space station, we had to build a lunar base, we had to develop advanced propulsion, we had to uh, somehow use the lunar base in support of the advanced propulsion spaceships that would be built at the space station, uh, and so forth. Uh, now, uh, and that created a 30-year timeline and um, a $400 billion price tag. Now, NASA recently um, topped that by coming up with a new idea, which they hadn't even hit on in the 90-day report, which is that they want to build a space station in lunar orbit too, mm. the purpose of which is, um, there is no purpose for which. <laughs> uh, and uh, so basically in the 90-day report, they were really spending money in order to give uh, everyone's pet program a role in uh, in the plan. Uh, it's like um, rewriting Shakespeare's plays to give everyone in the school a part. Um, but in this case, um, f frankly, they weren't spending money to do things at all. They were just doing things to spend money. Mm. And talk to us about when we think about the Mars direct proposal and we'll dig into some of the details and the different phases and aspects of it. One of the most notable aspects of it to me is that it does not require the development of any new technology that we don't currently have access to. Is that right? Well, no new fundamental technology. There are certainly new pieces of hardware in it, a heavy lift booster, a large Mars lander and so forth. But there, you know, we're not talking Los Alamos 1943 here. We're venturing into new realms of physics. We're talking about taking our craft of aerospace engineering and applying it to design uh, larger things, things uh, better backed up and so forth than what we've already built, but things of the same kind. Uh, and so the first thing I would say about Mars Direct is number one, its orientation, which is that it's mission driven. We're not trying to give everyone a part in the play. We're not trying to run our business to please our vendors. Mm. Okay. We are trying to get to Mars and we want to actually do it with as few critical technologies, as few vendors as possible, not with the maximum number. Okay. So, th so there's that, that it is simply a much sparer approach. That is the mentality behind it um, is we're doing the mission to do the mission not to make a bunch of people happy by giving them a part in the mission. Second thing is the actual approach itself, which um, makes use of Martian resources. Uh, it was our philosophy in designing the Mars Direct Plan that uh, the very things that make Mars interesting can also be what makes it attainable. That is how exploration on Earth has been supported in the past. Um, you know, in other words, Lewis and Clark never could have crossed America, 27 men, unless they hunted their way across. They obviously used local water, local air. In some cases, they traded with Native Americans for resources. But in all cases, they were using the resources present in the environment that they were operating in. If they had attempted to bring all their food, water, and air, they would have needed a wagon train of supplies for every man and for every horse. So then they would have needed further wagon trains for all the men and horses in the wagon trains, and on and on. It would have been an impossible mission. And Robert, so, the, the way that if I understand correctly, the way that that concept relates to your proposal is that we would actually use your, your plan would use Martian resources for the return back to Earth. Is that correct? That is correct. That is the way the mission works is first we shoot an Earth return vehicle to Mars. We can do that with one launch of a heavy lift vehicle that goes and it lands on Mars unfueled. Uh, it then makes its return fuel automatically out of the Martian atmosphere, which is carbon dioxide and water. We can mm. turn carbon dioxide and water into methane, which is natural gas, is good fuel, and 
oxygen, which is the oxidizer to burn the fuel. So once you have a fully fueled Earth return vehicle waiting for you on Mars, then you shoot the crew out to Mars. And once again, that's a, a, a one-way launch, one launch of a heavy lift booster. It goes and it lands near the Earth return vehicle. They use the habitat that they fly to Mars in as their house on Mars, as their base on Mars. At the end of a year and a half of exploring on Mars, they get in the Earth return vehicle and they fly home. Each time you do this, you add another habitat to the base. And before you know it, you've built the beginning of the first human settlement on a new world. There's nothing in this that's fundamentally beyond our technology. That's a pretty brief explanation of the plan. If people want to know in great detail, I have a whole book on the subject called The Case for Mars. In the book, The Case for Mars, you talk not only about sort of the, the approach from a technical standpoint, but also you make the case for why it would be important to go to Mars. So in, in your estimation, what is interesting about Mars? What are the reasons to go to Mars? Well, there's three reasons to go to Mars. Um, there's the science, there's the challenge, and there's the future. Um, the science is finding out whether we're alone in the universe. Mars was once a warm and wet planet. If it's true that life evolves out of chemistry wherever it has the right kind of environment, uh, Mars had that environment. The environments on Mars and Earth were essentially the same in the period that life first appeared on Earth. So if life appears out of chemistry wherever you have the correct conditions, like water freezing to ice on a cold night, it mm. happens for sure, okay, uh, then life should have appeared on Mars. And if that's the case, then life is all over the universe. And since we now know the basic laws of evolution, um, drive life to develop more complex, more capable, more active forms, ever, uh, capable of, of more activity, intelligence, ever more rapid evolution. If life's everywhere, it means intelligence is everywhere. It means we're not alone. On the other hand, if we go to Mars and we find out that despite the fact that it had very similar conditions to the primitive Earth, no life appeared there, that can mean that the original life on Earth was a one in a trillion chance shot. And, you know, it's like winning the lottery. How do you know whether if you've won the lottery and you have never spoken to anyone else outside of your house, how do you know whether that's a sure bet that everyone experiences or whether you were one in a billion? Mm. Okay. If you go check with your neighbor and they've also won the lottery, you can assume that it's a pretty common experience. On the other hand, uh, if you check around the neighborhood and no one else has ever won the lottery, you can say, gee, I'm pretty lucky. Yeah, I'll say. So there's the science. Um, now, uh, then there's the challenge. You know, I, I think humans are, are like, uh, uh, societies are like individuals. We grow when we challenge ourselves. We stagnate when we don't. A Humans to Mars program be tremendous positive bracing challenge to every society that participates, particularly to the youth. It would say to every young person, learn your science. You can be a pioneer in new worlds. Out of that challenge, we'd get millions of young scientists, engineers, inventors, technological entrepreneurs, medical researchers, the works. Uh, these are the kind of people that drive society forward. If you want to create intellectual capital, the way you do it is by challenging youth, not by, youth, not by brutalizing them with uh, uh, perpetual testing, which is apparently what Washington thinks can work. Mm. Um, and then finally, there's the future. I mean, really, if, if we do this, then 500 years from now, there'll be new branches of human civilization, not only on Mars, but on thousands of planets orbiting stars in this region of the galaxy. And when they look back at this time, what will they consider as important? When we look back 500 years, what do we consider important? You ask any American what happened in 1492, it's Christopher Columbus. Nobody says, well, in 1492, the Borgias took over the papacy, which they did. And that would have been the big headliner to, if there had been big time newspapers in 1492. Mm. England, France signed a peace treaty in 1492. Who knows that? Okay, you know, lots of things happened in 1492 that no one today cares about or knows about. But Columbus matters to us because he made us possible. Okay, and similarly, you know, 500 years from now, nobody's going to care which gang of thugs came out on top in Syria, you know, or, or, you know, who won or who lost various political gang warfare fights. Um, but what we did to make the future spacefaring civilization of humanity possible, that's what's going to matter. Okay. That, I mean, this time will be remembered because this is when we first set sail for other worlds. Mm. Robert, I want to touch a little bit on the uh, sort of psychological and sociological aspects of the mission to go you know, back a little bit down into the micro. Uh, question one, which we just haven't touched on yet, is how long would, would the trip to Mars be? But once you've answered that, which I know you'll be able to do in, in very short order, 
Uh, talk to me a little bit about the expected psychological and sociological issues that might come up in terms of a, a duration with this level of isolation, a small group of people for a year and a half on Mars plus the travel time. Well, the flight plan is six months out, year and a half on the surface, six months back. So mm -hmm. two and a half years away from Earth, but only six months traveling to Mars one way. And uh, now that's a standard rotation on the space station. People do that all the time. Uh, and people have done much rougher things in the past. I mean, look, Anne Frank and her family were in an attic for two and a half years surrounded by Nazis. And those were ordinary people chosen by circumstances, not chosen for maximum psychological, you know, toughness or anything of the sort. So people can deal with this, and, and they have dealt with much tougher stuff than this. I think the human factors problem of a human Mars mission is extremely overdrawn. Hmm. In what particular way? What aspect of it do you think is getting maybe more attention than it deserves? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, first of all, there's been some studies where they take some people who with limited selection, put them in a habitat for, in case, one case in Moscow for 500 days with nothing to do. That's an isolation study. You put people in a newspaper office with nothing to do in a month, you'd, you'd show pathologies, okay? Mm -hmm. the, 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 but a Mars mission is not going to have nothing to do. A Mars mission is going to have all kinds of great stuff to do. They're going to be exploring a new world that, you know, I mean, really, uh, the problem they're going to have if they have a psychological problem will be overwork because they're going to be driving themselves to try to accomplish the maximum they can in the limited amount of time they have on Mars, which has been provided to them at enormous expense by society. So, and, you know, we actually see this ourselves. The Mars Society has two practice Mars bases, one in the desert, one in the Arctic, and we task them to do programs of exploration. And these are scientists, they want to be there. They're not like Navy crews in Antarctica that are exiled who want to really be in San Diego on, on the waterfront, you know, where they can go to nightclubs on the weekend leave. I mean, no, these are people in their element and they're explorers and they want to be there. They, they, they would devote their careers for a chance to be there. And, uh, and they also know, all of them know that if they make it back, they're made people. You know, they're, they're going to get put on corporate boards. They're going to have advertising endorsements. They'll be rich. Um, you know, Apollo astronauts, a lot of people, they would write checks. People wouldn't even cash their checks. They'd want to keep the check so they'd have their autograph. Huh. Uh, uh, and uh, th so there you have it. Um, and uh, so I just don't buy it. I mean, you know, in World War II, millions of Americans were away from home for three years, you know, eating crap food and, and, and sitting in muddy trenches and being, you know, brutalized by 90 day wonders and, 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 and you know, drill sergeants and, and with Nazis or Japanese trying to kill them. And, and, you know, they handled it. This is a walk in the park compared to that. Wow. Robert, last thing I want to touch on, uh, given all of the proposals that are currently sort of out there, given what we know about the different proposed timelines of different projects, what's your best guess as to what year a human will first step foot on Mars? I think that we can do it in the late 2020s. From a technical point of view, we can be on Mars in eight years. Uh, what it takes is the will. Right now, I'm seeing more will from SpaceX than from NASA, although NASA, frankly, is better equipped to do it. They have much more resources. Mm. But where there's a will, there's a way. And where there's not a will, there's not a way. We've been speaking with Robert Zubrin, the Mars Direct Project. He is an aerospace engineer and author. Uh, fascinating, Robert. Thanks so much for talking to us today. Thank you.